the several influential women in the Bible who are not given names, Job's wife, for instance, comes to mind, the wife of Pilate is perhaps the most shadowy. All that is known of her from the scriptures is her relationship to the procurator Pontius Pilate and the message she sent to him while he was seated on the seat of judgment in the praetorium the morning Jesus of Nazareth was being tried for treason. Yet her message and its impact have been felt for the 2,000 years since it was delivered, and some arms of the church, the Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, the Oriental Orthodox, and the Ethiopian Orthodox churches, all venerate Pilate's wife as a saint, and some even venerate Pilate as well. Though the Bible does not give us much information about Pilate's wife, she does appear in a number of ancient accounts that arose in the first few centuries of Christianity. So, we'll first take a look at the early church's depiction of Claudia Procula, and then we'll delve deep into her dream, how it was discerned by her and by her husband, and later by theologians. Last, we'll see how her message has had continuing deep spiritual import. The earliest record we have outside the Bible that recounts the events of Jesus' crucifixion involving Pontius Pilate is a letter entitled Report of Pilate. Now, official reports of this kind were commonplace for that time, as a robust archive of events across the Roman Empire. Only a hundred years later, in 150 AD, Justin Martyr referred to this letter in his own writings. I'll have it for you at the end of this talk for you to read. About 10 years later, around 160 AD, in a manuscript entitled The Acts of Paul, Pilate's wife is depicted as having been baptized by the Apostle Paul. In another slightly later document called the Acts of Pilate, loosely dated to somewhere between 150 to 255 AD, we find out that the surname of Pilate's wife is Procula, and Pilate describes his wife as a god fearer favoring the custom of the Jewish faith. This statement established Pilate's wife as a proselyte of Judaism, who would certainly have been at the temple in the years she and Pilate were there in Judea, and certainly have heard Jesus teach in the court of the Gentiles around the temple steps. Later in this account, both Pilate and his wife are so grieved over Jesus' crucifixion that when the centurion arrives to report on Jesus' death, they find they cannot eat or drink for the whole rest of the day. Finally, early in the fourth century, Jeremy, who was a priest and a theologian and a historian, wrote that Pilate's wife, Claudia Procula, might be the same Claudia mentioned in one of Paul's letters. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. From these early church chronicles, the Eastern Church came to recognize Pilate's wife as having become a Christian, and perhaps Pilate as well, and honored them both as early martyrs of the faith. The story of Claudia's beginnings trace back to a second century narrative that spoke of her as the illegitimate daughter of Julia, Augustus Caesar's only natural child. Now, according to this chronicle, Julia proved to be a wild child, plowing through two marriages with highly publicized and flagrant extramarital affairs. When her second husband died, Julia evidently married Tiberius before he became the next emperor. However, she had not mended her ways and created such a scandal that even her all-powerful father, the Emperor Augustus, had no more recourse but to banish her to Gaul and allow Tiberius to divorce her. Once there, against the beautiful backdrop of the Alps, Julia gave birth to Claudia, and then she died shortly thereafter. One of the truths that I see in Claudia's early story is that destiny moves forward one step at a time. God had a crucial part to play for this little girl in the great drama and passion of Christ's death. And God would see to it that she would one day be where she needed to be. Eventually, as this story goes, Tiberius brought this daughter back and adopted her officially as his own daughter, then married her as a young girl to Pilate. Not long after that, a man named Sejanus came to power and Tiberius retreated for a time, leaving Sejanus to run the affairs of Rome. Reportedly friends with Pilate, it was then in 26 AD, that Sejanus gave Pilate, who was of the equestrian rank by this time in the military, an appointment as procurator to regions in Palestine. And as it turns out, Pilate took his bride with him. 
And here's where we're going to talk about her dream. It seems this marriage actually was a happy one. Ordinarily, the wives of Roman officials remained in Rome when their husbands were sent to their outposts, but Pilate and his wife had secured permission for her to accompany him. What's more, though they were stationed in the spacious and sophisticated city of Caesarea, it seems Claudia regularly went to Jerusalem with him, even though the festivals carried the potential danger of violent unrest, particularly during Passover. And evidently, Pilate's wife, a wealthy and well-connected royal, had significant political power behind the scenes, at least with her husband. Even though she was not permitted to vote, or even to be in the court, she did exert very real, if informal, influence. And we know this by how her message was relayed and received. As he was sitting upon the judgment seat, his wife sent words to him, saying, Nothing to you then is to be this righteous and just one, for I suffered much through a dream about him. She could not herself go to the praetorium. It was not permitted. And in any case, as a noble woman of good character and a Roman, she would not have made such a public appearance. But she sent a servant with an urgent message, and the servant was ushered to Pilate even as he was in the middle of a contentious court case, seated on the judge's bench. It seems clear Pilate trusted his wife, a woman of high breeding, excellent character, and an honorable patrician whom he respected, as did his whole house. He had purposely taken her with him to Jerusalem so they could be together, and without hesitation he motioned the servant to come forward with his message, and his wife trusted implicitly that he would. She was aware of the cases Pilate was seeing that day, even this hastily pulled together suit. It seems Pilate and his wife talked freely together about his work and the politics of Palestine. She had access not only to information, but Pilate's own thoughts on these matters. And she was clearly a spiritual woman. She had apparently been given a prophetic dream early that morning that had deeply disturbed her. Later, some theologians posited that she had fought with demons all through the night to receive this revelation from God, and that is what caused her distress and suffering. But for whatever reason, she knew her dream meant something terribly important, and she was concerned both for her husband and for the man who had been brought before him. Pilate, in turn, as any Roman would have, put great stock in this sort of thing. It was clearly guidance from the gods, and though he may not have been a philosophical man or even given to spiritual things, he was a religious man of sorts. He had twice tried to display images of Emperor Tiberius with his slogan, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of divine Augustus, into Jerusalem, and he had caused a violent resistance both times. Pilate was also a true Roman. He had been born into the southern Italian Ponti family, and he'd been raised as a plebeian. He earned his rank while serving in the Roman military, and he made a name for himself in military skill. He was even given the equestrian order, which was actually a middle rank for Roman nobility. In all this, he would have been deeply inculcated by the Roman sense of justice and righteousness. All four Gospels confirm Pilate's clear discomfort with executing an innocent man, and John in particular revealed how unnerved Pilate was by the Sanhedrin's accusation that Jesus called himself Son of God. So, Pilate took his wife's message very seriously, and he tried at least five separate times to spare Jesus the cross. John's Gospel treats Pilate sympathetically, saying Pilate tried everything he could to release Jesus out of a very real fear of who he was. And what I get from this is that earthly decisions can carry eternal consequence. Well, it might be argued that every human decision in some way affects eternity, but certainly some choices do carry eternity in the balance. Pilate's wife warned him that this decision would be much farther reaching than it might seem at first blush. She wanted him to have nothing to do with the fate of Jesus. Some Bible translators show this message as saying Jesus was innocent. However, Pilate's wife, by using the Greek word dikaios to describe Jesus, was calling to mind everything a Roman would value. Dikaios means always, both righteous and just, according to the divine standard of right. As one scholar puts it, for Romans, 
justice was the value that most legitimized their right to rule other people. It provided the very foundation for Pax Romana. Justice was in Pilate's bones, but his precarious political situation made Pilate vulnerable to manipulation, and ultimately he made possibly the most cosmically momentous decision in all of human history, greater perhaps even than the first man and the first woman as described in Genesis 3, because their decision plunged all humanity into the brokenness of sin, but it would not be for eternity. In contrast, by Pilate's command, humankind's destiny would be forever changed. So let's look at the spiritual import of this dream. Matthew's Gospel actually records five prophetic dreams in which revelation is given that could only come from God and was meant for the protection of God's Son. Four of those dreams came to Joseph, one to the Magi. Here's the first. Mary's husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. God had chosen Joseph as the earthly father to God's son. Mary's supernatural conception was confirmed, as was the nature of her unborn baby, and God instructed Joseph to stay and name the baby as any father would. Here's the next one. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. In protecting the infant Jesus from being killed by Herod the Great, God revealed Herod's hidden motives for asking the Magi to inform him of Jesus' birthplace. Here's another one. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So that very same night that the Magi left, God revealed to Joseph the hidden intrigue happening already within Herod's palace in Jerusalem. Now here's the last dream. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. So this is Joseph again. God was guiding Joseph and by this time was confirming Joseph's suspicions that Herod Archelaus would be dangerous to Jesus. In fact, Archelaus was later exposed as a very inept ruler and he was removed from office. And that's when Roman procurators were assigned to govern Judea directly from Rome. Meanwhile, God directed Joseph to move to Galilee rather than to resettle in Bethlehem of Judea where Jesus had been born. And as you can see, in each of these examples, God was unquestionably the source of prophetic dreams. Yet theologians have argued for centuries over the source of Pilate's wife's dream, the sixth and last recorded in Matthew's Gospel. It can't have been that she was non-Jewish because neither were the Magi Jewish. So it wasn't about her being a Gentile. What was it? Well, medieval theologians and Martin Luther held that Satan had sent the dream in an attempt to persuade Pilate to commute the death sentence and prevent Jesus from going to the cross, because Satan knew that this had been Christ's mission from the very beginning. If Satan could keep Jesus from the cross, the argument went, then God's plan for the redemption and restoration of humankind and the earth and the whole cosmos would be derailed. Now, interestingly, in one of those early church chronicles that I was talking to you about at the beginning of this uh, presentation, the temple authorities attributed the source of Pilate's wife's dream actually to Jesus. Here's how it goes. Pilate says to them, Behold, my wife has sent to me, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for many things have I suffered on account of him this night. And the Jews answering say unto Pilate, did we not tell thee that he was a sorcerer? Behold, he has sent a dream to thy wife. Now, on the other hand, very early in church history, theologians noted the remarkable revelation in Pilate's wife's dream. So let's look at it one more time. As he was sitting upon the judgment seat, his wife sent words to him saying, 
Nothing to you then is to be this righteous and just one, for I suffered much through a dream about him. Origin of Alexandria, early in the third century in his commentary on Matthew's gospel, wrote that God had sent this dream to Pilate's wife in order that she would come to know Christ and would later convert to Christianity. And then in the fourth century, theologians Augustine and Jeremy, and later John Calvin, all believed her dream had divine origins as a revelation of Christ's nature and Christ's purpose, being the righteous one who has come to satisfy the just judgment of God, that all who believe in him might have eternal life. And many theologians since have supported this view over these two millennia. Now read carefully, Pilate's wife sent him a message that contained the revelation of Christ's character and person and urged Pilate to keep out of what would happen to Jesus, have nothing to do with this case. Could be another way of wording what she said. I have been in anguish over what is about to happen with this man. Make sure you have no part in it, which might explain why he washed his hands. To see the dream of Pilate's wife in this light confirms how Jesus spoke with Pilate. In all the trials Jesus endured, it was only before Pilate that Jesus had a private hearing, that he was not mocked or accused or abused, that Jesus answered questions with fresh revelation, and that Jesus presented himself as divine. As Pilate conversed with Jesus, offering him dignity and a chance to speak, Jesus revealed to the procurator that this was not a political situation, but a spiritual one. Jesus was indeed a king, but of a spiritual realm that had no borders and was peopled by those who believed in him. My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here, for I was born to this. And for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And from this, I learned that divine revelation requires a response. And in truth, Pilate's wife immediately followed through with God's revelation by doing all she could to protect Jesus and to protect her husband. Ultimately, according to the testimony of early church history, she responded even more deeply by putting her faith in Christ. And for her husband, after being told by the temple officials that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, Pilate alone is described as experiencing a very real fear. Note John's irony in this. Pilate, the Roman idolater, knew to fear God in a way that the religious rulers seemed inured to. In his final interview with Christ, Jesus spoke to Pilate with kindness and with gravity. You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. The right response would have cost Pilate dearly. And often, when God gives you and me revelation, our right response will cost us dearly too. Because what we do with that insight is often going to go against worldly wisdom. So what do we do with that insight? When we pray and we ask God for guidance, or when we're reading the scriptures and we suddenly experience real clarity about a passage because it pertains to what's going on in our own life circumstances. And maybe God's spoken in an unusual way. Maybe God's spoken in a dream or a conversation or a distinct experience. But we know, as we continue to pray and read the Bible and consult with others who are wise and spiritually attuned, we know that this is God's voice to us. What do we do with that? Well, James, the early church leader, wrote, If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given you. But ask in faith, never doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter being double-minded, which is to say, having two priorities, 
having two worldviews, having, if you will, two masters, and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. In the end, unlike Joseph or the Magi, or even his own wife, Pilate did not follow God's instruction and decided to protect his earthly career against his better judgment. Sadly, just three years later, he was removed from office and sent into exile, and he died shortly after that. Now, through Claudia's story, you and I learned that destiny does move forward one step at a time. No matter what happens in our lives, no matter how unlikely our situation, God is shaping the events so that we'll be there for the appointments God has in mind for us. We also learn that earthly decisions can carry eternal consequence. Often enough, you and I may not even know how momentous our decision is going to be in the moment, which is why we regularly ask God for wisdom, and God will give us divine revelation that requires a response, a wholehearted, whole-minded response. Oh Lord God, thank you for your promise to generously give us the wisdom we need to make right decisions and follow through with right actions. Thank you for preserving Claudia's story, for showing us her courage and for encouraging us in the same way to trust your revelation and respond rightly. We pray it all to the praise of your glorious grace. Amen.